Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, everyone. I am Cheryl Mack with the Bridge Art Gallery, and we are excited to host tonight's artist talk virtually with one of our favorite people on the planet, extraordinary artist, visionary, Brian Small. We're I, uh, we're featuring Brian in a current exhibition called World Traveler at our new location down in Wilmington, Delaware. And so let's just hop right on into it. Let's welcome Brian Small. Hello. <laughs> Hello, friend. Visionary. How are you? <laughs> Good. Visionary is a, a new title. I'm like, visionary. I like it. I, I, I can deal with it. Hey, do you have vision? Are you creative? I do my best. I do my best. That makes today, you a visionary, yeah. my dear. So today I'm a visionary. <laughs> today you're a visionary. You've got this lovely art behind you. <laughs> yeah, this is an old uh, old piece, a couple years old, but one of my favorites. So it's just in my office. I tack different things up or put, why? I feel like I'm screaming. Um, <laughs> I up different pieces all the time. And so I figured... Mm -hmm sitting in my office, I should put something on the wall because there was nothing up there. So if it comes crashing down, you know, whatever, we're good. Hey, that art, art, art is exciting, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm excited. So we're here to talk about all things. I mean, this is like a gab session between you and I, yeah. because we, it feels like we've known each other forever. Absolutely. Um, but um, you are an award-winning alcohol ink artist. Uh, no, we're not doing the rolling the eyes. We're accepting the oh praise. Award-winning, true. Very, Fair. Yes, it, it is very true. I mean, it's well-deserved. So for, you know, the five people who don't know you. <laughs> in the universe. On the planet, in the universe. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, as well as how you got started using the medium of alcohol ink. Yeah, so I'm originally from Washington, D.C., um, moved to the New York area for college, and now is 80 years later, and I am still here. I went back to D.C. for a brief moment, but came right back. Um, so I have now lived in the New York tri-state area longer than I have in my hometown, D.C. Um, so this is home. Uh, when it comes to art, uh, I was always encouraged to be creative. Like my mom is a painter, for those of you that don't know, but uh, Diane English, she's a an artist, a painter, a sculptor. She does everything and um, has always been creative. And uh, she and my father always encouraged me to do whatever it is that I wanted to do, good, bad, or indifferent, um, as long as I was fine, you know, as long as I was safe, I could you know, kind of create and do what I wanted to do. Um, I say alcohol ink in a lot of ways found me. My mom introduced me to it. She came across a woman um, that had this beautiful, brightly colored necklace uh, on an art tour in D.C. And um, she went up to her because we love jewelry and said, you know, what is that necklace? Um, how, like, what is that? And it turned out it was alcohol ink on dominoes. Mm. And because alcohol ink give you the, the background on it. Alcohol ink, it's a highly pigmented dye that when it comes into contact with rubbing alcohol, it causes the inks to move around and it works best on materials that are non-porous. So glass, metal, tile. I paint on Upo paper, which is a synthetic paper, but dominoes are acrylic typically mm -hmm. and don't absorb. And so uh, someone had done alcohol ink uh, on dominoes and made it into a necklace. And so she asked her about alcohol ink and started to do the research. Like, I, I have no idea what that is. And shortly thereafter, uh, my mom came to town and was like, you need to try this. Okay. And something clicked. And here it is, you know, several years later. And we're talking about a show that I got in Wilmington, Delaware. So That's right. World traveler, to be exact. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> you said a whole lot of things that uh, I, I want to comment on. Um, well, we'll start backwards. One, you know, you mentioned that, you know, alcohol ink is activated by, you know, using alcohol. And um, I've seen you actually, you know, create and 
what I love what you do with alcohol ink is you're able to control it and you're able to convey texture. And so it's like you're taking this, you know, uncontrollable medium and having it do what you need it to do. Sometimes. I, <laughs> I, I think that I have worked hard to try and manipulate and get ink to, to kind of like uh, to manipulate it, to get it to do what I want it to do. But that's still not certain. I could say maybe there are certain techniques and things that I've developed um, in my practice that uh, I can recreate. I can, I can, I've mastered. But uh, I always describe it as a dance and that sometimes I get to lead and sometimes the inks get to lead. And mm -hmm. I just have to be um, pliable enough, flexible enough to not get caught up in what I want the art to be and just let it be. Whatever comes out of it organically, um, I just kind of have to roll with it. Um, and sometimes that's very easy to do and it works really well. And then there are other times where I am in a battle, like mm -hmm. we are fighting to get control and mastery over the inks or the inks are like trying not to be controlled. So um, I've gotten to the point that I can do certain things technically over and over and over again. But if you said this painting behind me, make it in only purple and yellow, I couldn't mm -hmm. do it. Right. Well, you know, I just had a thought for the first time. Alcohol ink is the Gemini of art mediums. Absolutely. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. <laughs> Um, <laughs> which, which I say is similar to how I kind of move around the world. Sometimes I'm good. Sometimes I'm good. Right. Sometimes you're the little angel. Sometimes you're the little. Right. That, that's devilish. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> but yeah, I thought about that for the first time. Um, and if you don't know, Brian is a Gemini. Yes. And then when my, one of my shows uh, from earlier this year, I titled Gemini. And okay. it was about the duality that... Um, you could be a good guy and a bad bitch at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the duality of people constantly saying to me like, oh my gosh, you are just so nice. You are always in a good mood. Like, no, I'm not always in a good mood, mm -hmm. but I try and give the best parts of myself to art. I try and be as kind as I can to people, but I don't call myself nice. I'm like, grandmas are nice. I'm mm -hmm. not a grandma. Um, and... Um, I'm not always in a good mood. I think I try and show the best parts of myself and and offer that to people that I come into contact with because that's what I want back. Right. But by no means am I always in a good mood. There are some times where it's not nice, but I save that for myself. I don't, you know, offer that to the rest of the world. Well, you know, one thing about artists that I really admire is, um, you know, artists have the ability, creatives in general have the ability to um, express themselves through their artistry. Um, but at the same time, creatives to me are the most vulnerable people on the planet because you put all of your heart and your soul and all your vulnerabilities into your artwork and then you put it up for public display for the world to judge and have an opinion on. And so, you know, I, I hands, hands down, you know, artists are definitely, and creatives are the most, um, brave people on, on the planet um, because of the fact that you display your vulnerabilities, but your ability to, you know, be vulnerable is also a safe space for others. Yeah, I, I think vulnerability, um, I don't use my art to work out my stuff. Okay. Uh, what I try and do is if, when I am painting, like I said, I try to give the best parts of myself. I realize that people are uh, collecting my work and putting it into their safe spaces and their mm -hmm. sacred spaces. So I am conscious of not putting like my bad juju into the work. So if I am mm -hmm. not in the best of moods, I'm not in a good place. I'm in a place where I need self-care. I need to... Um, take a beat for myself, that's when I don't paint. I don't use my angst or pain or anger in, in my art in that way. I may mm -hmm. um, be in a better place. Maybe it may have had something happen and like had to take a moment to myself. And then when I go to the art, it's all goodness. It's all 
um, positive energy. And if the vulnerability happens to be, you know, something that I'm working through, it's not something that I'm consciously doing. If I am feeling weird or uncertain, I don't use my art. I try and use, I try and use the tools that, uh, <laughs> Crystal, my therapist, <laughs> Excellent. Our therapist, but, yes, Crystal Jones. <laughs> so <laughs> that's where I use that, and I I leave all the the tough stuff um, mm -hmm. outside of my art, and I think that's what people connect with is the the good feeling, the joy, the color, and energy that you get from that. That is with intention mm -hmm. to to really put good stuff in there. You know what I what I do love about your artwork, Brian, is the reaction and the emotion that it generates from the viewer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you know, maybe it's a mix between, you know, the color palettes because, you know, the color palettes are very vibrant, um, but it, it does give a reaction. So as an artist, when you've created something and you've created a piece of work, how does it feel when it really impacts others? Like what's that, What's that, you know, connection for you? It's a payoff because you want people to react, even if it's a negative reaction. If they're like, I don't like that. I would much rather you have a visceral response like, oh, no, I don't like abstract. I don't I don't care for that. That that creeps me out. That makes my skin, skin crawl. I would mm -hmm. rather that than that's nice. So I would like whatever the emotion is I've had. If this happened at Bridge Art Gallery a couple of mm -hmm. years ago. Um, where a collector stood in front of the piece and burst into tears. And mm -hmm. I happened to be standing behind watching, kind of giving her space to take in the show. And she stood in, in front of a piece. And the only thing I saw was her hand go to her throat and her chest. Mm -hmm. And I kind of eased my way over to her and asked, you know, are you okay? Is everything okay? And she couldn't find the words for a bit. And eventually she said, um, Thank you for helping me to remember how to feel. Mm. And at that point, if she asked for the painting, she could have had it for free because it that's the payment for me. The fact that there was such, an, such a response and I try not to tell you what to feel or what to think. And that's even through the titles of my work. I want you to get what you get out of it. I don't want to tell you what to see. So even if it is a shape of, of something that looks like a tree, I'm never going to call it the tree. I'd much rather you tell me what you see and what you feel. And often that's something that I never was even in the mindset of. I let the art kind of do the work and have people have their own connection to it versus my intention for the work my intention for the work or the way that I want it displayed or what you get from it often is so not in line with the person that connects with the piece is so not in line. Mm -hmm. Typically. Um, I just have to go with, I know why I created it and the intention behind it, what you get from it. Honestly, none of my business. <laughs> and um, what's so, what's so, you know, unique about not just your art, but I think, you know, any creative work, it is a subject, art is very subjective yeah. in the sense that, you know, whatever you see, whatever you feel, it's that individual experience that you have. And, um, and really it's that experience that connects people to art that, you know, wants, you know, that encourages them to purchase it and be able to have that experience over and over again um, in their homes and, you know, support art, art is a great gift. Hello, yes. we're in the holiday season. <laughs> art is for sale. All the art is for sale. Our art is for sale. <laughs> so, you know, let's talk about um, this specific show, which yes. is World Traveler. And we'll bring up, you know, some images here on the screen and we can kind of talk through it. Hello, handsome gentleman there. So, <laughs> that's <for> me. <laughs> that's you. That's you, boo. That's you. So, that is the thing is is that photo that photo looks like it was like staged and everything. That is in my studio in front of my rack of paintings. So hey, that was your photo moment. shoot. We're gonna go with that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, world traveler. Um so, it was what, oh, you go. Yeah, what was the inspiration behind World Traveler? 
So I started uh, World Travel. I was doing a residency at Mana Contemporary with the Eileen S. Kaminsky Family Foundation, ESCIF. Um, and for that residency, uh, I had, I guess I pitched that during that residency, I would work on a body of work, um, which I'd never done in this way before, going about a whole collection all at one time. I never really worked that way. I can create collections and stories through, you know, as I'm working through the pieces, like, oh, these really work well together and create a story and narrative that way. But for the World Traveler Collection, I went in with a plan to do a collection of large scale paintings um, that um, kind of spoke to the the space that we were in at the time, like heading into the pandemic, le leading into 2020, I felt like, oh my gosh, anything is possible. The year is starting off so great. And we did uh, the opening for Expressive Creative Soul in February, and it was super large and feeling really, really energetic and, and happy about uh, what was happening. And I started off the year with that, uh, with the residency and started to work through these piece, pieces and I still hadn't had a direction for it, but I knew that I wanted to do these large scale pieces that kind of were vibrant and energetic and um, kind of showed different ways, of, different techniques of working in alcohol ink. And I thought about, gosh, I would love to like travel right now. I would love to kind of go to some different places, even though I'm here at this residency, would love to be able to see the world and thought, cool, wouldn't it be cool to do a collection of work that spoke to my favorite cities right. or places that I aspire to go to? Um, and so each piece that's in that collection uh, represents and embodies the color and energy of the city that is named for, in my eyes, based on my experiences or the way that I think about those places. And so develop this collection around it. And it, though I, it started at the residency, I finished the collection um, about seven months into the pandemic is when I finished okay. the collection and put the period at the end of the sentence. So just time out for a second. Can we talk about how much fun January and February were? Of I know. <laughs> I, it felt like anything was possible. I remember at that show, the opening of the show, it was a large show. It was probably like 14 artists in the show. Yeah. And mm -hmm. everybody showed up and came to play. And there were the photos from that opening night. It was packed. And it, was one, it was one of our, probably our biggest openings, um, definitely, well, you know, annually the Expressive Creative Soul show is very important to Christopher yeah. and I. Um, and, you know, the work that year was amazing. And then we went right into 14C. Yeah, um, it, was, it was so much. Well, no, 14C was worse. But if I think 14C, no, 14C was right after that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it was also that, of course, for me, Bridge, the the Expressive Creative Soul show that year was the first time that I curated it with you guys. Um, um, that and, was 2020. Yeah. Um, and I was so excited um, to bring all these artists together at like my favorite gallery where I started out. Like this is this is the jam. And it was so many people there and we were having such a good time. And little did we know that just a couple be weeks, like locked down right and like just a couple <laughs> weeks later we wouldn't be seeing each other we wouldn't be hanging out we would everything would switch to this virtual world and um and then i was longing to travel to these places so can we talk well i, I know you know brian you and i we can, can talk about art and gap, you know, for forever. And I do want to get to your work, but I'm reminded that that was actually the start of the Garden Renaissance. Yeah, because Danielle Scott was in that show, Phil Robinson, um, Cortez, Cortez, um, mm -hmm. Martrice was in that show. Mm -hmm. It was like everybody was connected. And if you weren't in the show, you still ended up at the opening because our network is so tight. Our right. family, our art family is so connected that that night everybody showed up. And there are a number of group photos that like blow my mind. Like this is history happening 
-hmm. right here. Like this is this is real deal. And we didn't we didn't know what was to come. But well, I think mm -hmm. I, I package it in this way that we needed that extra love and connection um, and to strengthen our bonds, you know, through art, through friendship um, at that time, because yeah. it was friends, friendships, um, people we care about and art that really sustained us during the pandemic. Yep, absolutely. So that was the uh, the way that the universe was, you know, coming together to say, you know, you need a you need a special family unit to go into the next season. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I feel like um, the discussions as that show wrapped up. Um, I don't know how many people know this, but after the show, there's always a pickup time often, mm -hmm. and that particular show at the pickup time, everybody kind of hung out. We ended up setting up a table and mm -hmm. everybody sat and talked for probably two hours or right. more about what we wanted the um, art world to become, how we could make a larger impact in the artist community, um, in the art industry at large. And we talked for an extended amount of time about what was to happen next. And that kind of set, um, set the tone of like having these family discussions um, at a time that we didn't know we were going to be leaning on each other virtually so much more, but it kind of set the blueprint of what the garden renaissance and what this movement has been that was tangible. We could feel in the air that big things were coming, that right. some great stuff is happening. Um, doors are unlocking, windows are you know unhinged and stuff is happening for us. Um, and it just so happened the pandemic dropped itself right smack dab in the middle of it but we still we still thrive and we out here still thriving still moving forward but also taking on the charge to be accountable to one another yeah hey pig just so you pop up sorry yes <laughs> Peg, we miss you um so let's get into uh, because you know we can go on tangents for 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 hours but let's get into your moment which is world traveler um, series yeah. and let's go through you know some of these spectacular images and talk about you know some of the cities that it represents. Yeah, so this is the first time that this collection of work is being shown all together. Um, outside of the one, there were two other paintings that were collected by uh, Eskif, the family foundation that did the residency. But this is the only time that this body has been shown. This body of work has been shown together in this way. So and thank uh, you for trusting us with your art babies. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, we'll talk about this, of course, but Bridge Art Gallery is home. Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking about traveling the world, it's always good to come back home. So that's right. Um, so the first painting here is Nairobi. And this mm -hmm. is one of the pieces um, done later in the collection um, during lockdown. Um, but I knew that I, the collection wasn't done. I felt like there were still a few more pieces that needed to get done. And there were three that I completed um, following the residency uh, during the pandemic. And this was one of them. And special shout out to our Nairobi queen that we know, Grace Kisa. <laughs> yes, she is fabulous. She's a quiet storm. She is so fabulous. I can't take it. <laughs> okay. The so is London. So I this for some people doesn't look like London, but I'll tell you um, my intention and mm -hmm. where my mind was in creating this is if you've ever been to London in the springtime, it rains all the time. The sun comes out, it rains. But there are all these wrought iron gates everywhere. Um, as you walk around the parks, there are all these wrought iron gates and behind those gates are flowers and people. Um, and that's what this kind of looked like to me, that it would be raining and this fluid just going everywhere, you know, water everywhere, but you always see the flowers through those gates, through the dark bars. And that's that's what um, this reminded me of. I'm like, this is, this is what London looks like. It's a little dreary, but it's still colorful and bright at the same time. So uh, I'm going to tell you what when I saw this for the first time, what I thought about and what I saw in, of London, um, and then I'll tell you what uh, a recent visitor to the exhibition said. 
Um, when I saw it, I immediately, I, I saw London also, but for very different reasons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I've traveled to London, London has a very, you know, vibrant pub scene. And it doesn't matter if it's raining, well, it's raining there a lot, yeah. but people are out. They're out in the pubs, always. they're always having a good time and it doesn't matter where, when, if it's raining or not. So to me, it symbolized that, you know, even when it's raining, London is still alive on and popping because people are out at the pub having a good time. So a recent um, visitor to the exhibition said that she saw London, but she saw Bridges. Huh. And I was like, oh, okay. I could see that. I could see that. <laughs> I could see it 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one in person, I mean, it, it looks like organized chaos and all of that. But this one in particular has these really little tiny gold lines that I painted in as well, just to give it a little depth and dimension. Um, but I remember working on this piece. It's like I have these like connections to the work. And I typically, though I have a large body of work, I'm usually able to recall when I did it. I'm able to remember almost every piece, even if I don't remember the name, mm -hmm. I remember doing it. Okay. I remember doing this one. All right. Tokyo. So uh, this, this particular painting, there are two paintings that usually are up in my studio. And this is one of them. Um, Tokyo and Tokyo, this this painting in person again has like these um, neon flash moments. And I think about all of the technology and neon screens mm -hmm. that you see um, in Tokyo, but there's also this calm and peace to the people and the vibe and energy. And that's why I, I thought peaceful, serene, but also this dynamic technology and movement um, for this piece. And they're also, when you look at it, there are a number of eyes that kind of peep out at you in different places. Um, no, I they, didn't see the, I didn't see the eyes initially, but again, a different visitor to the exhibition was like, oh, I, I see the eye. She saw it right away. And then I couldn't unsee it. <laughs> yeah. It's one that's in the center of the painting and one that's closer to the lower right hand corner of the painting that once you see it, it's, it, it's kind of eerie and weird, but mm -hmm. you can't unsee it. Once once your eyes kind of catch one another, it's, it's there. So this as well as Tokyo uh, was, Tokyo, there's uh, several paintings that uh, have this kind of texture. And that uh, came of me trying to figure out a way to create dimension mm -hmm. and doing something different. So I started to literally cut through the inks using different blades and um, knives and scrapers and everything to create dimension. The challenge is, uh, if you haven't worked with alcohol ink before, it is really difficult to get it to stay in place. Mm -hmm. So because it's so fluid, it doesn't work like when you're doing like scraping uh, in acrylic because the alcohol ink um, kind of activates on the surface of the paper. And so if I draw a straight line and I cut through the inks, it doesn't always stay. And so it's a balance of letting the inks dry and then trying to create depth and cut through to the bottom layer. Um, that People don't care how the sausage is made. Just know that it is difficult to get these lines in the space and the dimension um, because alcohol ink is always moving. Well, I mean, it, we do want to know, you know, the secret sauce, you know, behind behind the masterpiece. But because, you know, it's it, to me, I'm always fascinated by your work um, because of the texture, because of the, you know, three dimensional aspect of it, um, because I know how, you know, uncontrollable, you know, the medium, the medium is it's to me, it, it functions a little bit like watercolor and then yeah. it doesn't. And it, it's similar to watercolor, except instead of water, I'm using 91% rubbing alcohol or higher, you know, different alcohols do different things, but uh, it is very fluid. And so I work on a flat surface and sometimes even, even then every groove in my table, if the table is tilted, if um, it's too humid, all of those things um, make 
an impact on the final piece. Um, now, something that, that I want to stay doesn't always stay. So let me ask you as we go to the next piece, have you ever, you know, something, some magic combination and the end result was so magical and you were like, oh, I'm gonna try to do this again. And it doesn't work. It happens doesn't. all the time. Okay. All the time. And that th sometimes I will uh, test out different techniques or ideas on smaller pieces mm -hmm. and then try to do it again in a larger piece. And that rarely happens. Rarely so happens. the Gemini aspect of alcohol ink says, mm, sorry. Not today, boo. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like that was cute yesterday. It's not happening. So the last piece was called Berlin. Okay. And um, it was all about the architecture. And um, yeah, it, it's all about architecture. And um, it also seemed kind of cool. And I've never been to Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, but I always think when I think about Berlin, I think about um, hard edges and architecture and art and technology in the way that they cross over. And so that's where that one, that's where the name came from, this one. Okay. So this one is New Orleans, New Orleans. And um, this one just felt, as I was creating it, it felt like it was jazz. It felt like movement and culture. And um, there are a couple to me, like dancing bodies in there mm -hmm. that I'm like, this is New Orleans. This is the period. Um, and I've been there a couple times and it's just a vibrant, energetic city with deep culture and um good food good and that's food. What it feels like right. feistiness feisty yeah. people uh so centered in themselves and in their culture and their place in the world um and it it, it is colorful um yeah. the people are colorful um they're you know in their talk their dance their you know their their ways and then the food of course blah. Outrageous. Yeah, it, it's just, it's, this is one of my favorite paintings. Mm -hmm. um, and it's certain paintings that I fall in love with for a moment. New Orleans is one. Um, I believe Anacostia will show that, which is probably my favorite piece. No, I won't say favorite. Top five Anacostia top is five. one of my top five. Um, I have to admit, New Orleans. It's, it's one of my top five, too. That in, that in my <laughs> oh, hobby. Next. So yes, Anacostia, this is a painting. I didn't, the painting for my home where I grew up, but I did not want to call it Washington, D.C. because this does not look like D.C. to me. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like my neighborhood, which is Anacostia in Southeast Washington, D.C. Um, because if you're, if you're from Southeast or lived in Southeast, uh, um, a specific point in time in like the 80s, early 90s, um, Union Temple Baptist Church came to Anacostia. And with that came an influx of new restaurants and new people and new energy. They redid a portion of Good Hope Road where right off where I grew up. Um, and every year there was this event called Unifest mm -hmm. in the summer. And it would bring... Um, different cultures and exhibitors from all over the city to our neighborhood for this like big block, big block party. There was music. It was tied to the church. So there's like gospel, there's food happening, there's people selling t-shirts and artwork. And then there's this huge party with different go-go bands and African drummers, everything. And that's what this looked like to me. And Anacostia has this rich color and vibrancy, but it has a hard edge. Protect your neck. Yes, but, that's right. <laughs> but, but it's still like, it feels warm and colorful. And it's all these people that you've never met before that's completely different than, say, the vibe of New York City. But it's this concentration of beautiful black and brown people. Chocolate, um, chocolate yeah. city. And, and that's so that's what Anacostia is all about. And I knew that um, someone like Anna or just saying Anacostia or what is what is this place? I wanted people to like, let me look this up. What is Anacostia? And mm -hmm. um, this is that's what it embodies to me. Yeah, because, you know, again, when the exhibition was up and we had, you know, a really good crowd that came through to view the exhibition. 
um, a woman who had lived in DC, of course, not in Anacostia, but <laughs> she had lived in DC. And she was like, Anacostia, like the river? And I was like, no more like the neighborhood. And she was like, oh, I didn't, she didn't know that there was a, a neighborhood in Anacostia. So those of our viewing audience who's not familiar, um, Anacostia is in Washington, D.C., the hometown of Brian and myself. Yes. And um, and so um, Anacostia is a neighborhood um, in uh, southeast Washington, D.C. And it is, you, the, as Brian said, the home of culture, music, um, uh, get right, everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All sauce and chicken wings. Exactly. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's such a great neighborhood. I was, I moved to Anacostia when I was like nine or 10. My parents bought a house in Anacostia. And before I was in Southeast, just uh, in a different neighborhood. But it was such, it's such a home residential place mm -hmm. that right around the corner is everything that you need. Right. Everywhere. Um, and even more so now, but uh, it was a great place to grow up. Absolutely. Hands down, Washington, D.C. I mean, New York is cool. Yeah, I love it. I love the. I love it here. And I would imagine that growing up here would be great, too. The amount mm -hmm. of access that you have to things. But I, I wouldn't trade it. I love growing up in Anaheim. But, you know, I would say I would say this um, about Washington, D.C., um, because, you know, we 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 grew up in, in Washington, D.C., and there is a unique sense of culture growing up in DC um, because everywhere you look, you see people like yourself. Right. Teachers, doctors, dentists, um, bus drivers, um, people in leadership positions. Like that, yeah. that's all you see. You're you're immersed in your your own cultural excellence that you see everywhere, every day. And so I think it creates um you know, an, an extra sense of pride, um, an extra sense of grounding, because you can, anything you aspire to, to be in life, you can see someone in your neighborhood, in your church, you know, on your local news um, represented so you can see the pathway. And it's something about being able to see where you want to go through the example of others. Yeah. And it's great to be able to have those examples. Some people never had that, right. didn't grow up with that. So mm -hmm. I, I think growing up in such a cultured neighborhood helped, but also having access to the Smithsonian. I spent most of my weekends at a museum, just kind of hanging out or on the National Mall, catching, mm -hmm. learning to catch the bus, the A6, the, <laughs> the A2. <laughs> the B2, you know, all these different bus lines that would, mm -hmm. the A16 that it would take me um, right downtown DC to 10th and Penn, and I get off the bus and would like walk down to the mall and go to the uh, National Portrait Gallery or go to the Air and Space Museum, all the different um, museums there just to hang out. And I think that gave me um, a thirst for more art um, and creativity. It was accessible. Yeah, and the, the exposure to that made me think that it's possible. And there were a number of Black artists featured in D.C. all the time in different spaces. Right. So um, loved it. I do, too. All right, moving on. Another piece that was created um, while on lockdown, this one is called Welcome Home. And it was a painting that was done for Jersey City and where I live. And um, I needed a piece of, this was like the last one that I did that I, I may have said this earlier, that it's nothing like traveling. You get to see the world and then you get to come home. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like, well, I live here. I love Jersey City. I'm a part of like the artistic fabric. Like I need to somehow get Jersey City in there without calling it Jersey City. It's not the best name for a painting. <laughs> um, and so I thought, welcome home, like welcome home, JC, that would be the name of the painting. But uh, Jersey City um, is said to be uh, the most diverse city uh, per capita in the U.S. because of yeah. the, the, the amount of diversity here. And that's what this 
kind of represents to me all the different colors um, and different sections of the city. Um, so let's talk about how Jersey City loves you back. Uh, thanks, Jersey City. Some days, that less, I, I want to be fair that yes, Jersey City loves, I think Jersey City loves on me. Yes. But so, but no, we, we have to take a pause and acknowledge the fact that you just won an award. So tell yes. us about the, the honor you just received from Jersey City. So the Jersey City Arts Awards were last week, um, which are, I guess, delivered or sponsored by the Jersey City Arts Council. And last Wednesday, less than a week ago, I was presented with the Leadership Award, um, which means a lot to me. Um, as an artist, as a curator, as a connector uh, in art, um, to be honored with the Leadership Award may, means a lot, means a lot. I think it is a, a representation of the way that Jersey City loves me or supports me, but it's also indicative of the love that I poured into the community, the, the way that I tried to connect people and help people um, open doors, to be responsible for um, a community of artists. I am co-president of Pro Arts, um, uh, organization uh, that represents professional artists in their development, uh, their professional development and artistic journey. And I signed on to their board and to become, uh, made my way to become co-president of Pro Arts because I wanted to make sure that our verse, our voices are amplified. Not only just artists, Black artists, gay artists, marginalized artists in the community to ensure that they have a voice and that their aesthetics, that their needs are addressed, that they are not forgotten in the larger landscape of artists and art. The, the end of it, like the gallery system for some people is not always kind to, to people of color or artists that uh, don't have their MFA. Um, mm -hmm. You're considered an outsider. And I wanted to make sure that when I had the opportunity to sit at the table that, you know, the, the, the whatever, the table, that mm -hmm. I was there representing myself, representing people that I care about, representing my people in general, and making sure that every voice has the opportunity to be seen and heard. Um, so and so that so part of it, I know I put in the work to mm -hmm. earn a leadership award. It feels right. good to have it recognized and um, to be awarded or honored with that. But I know that I put in the work because I care so much about the community and art. So I'm going to um, just, you know, do a little name checking of people that you have been, you know, extremely instrumental in your leadership while, um, while with Pro Arts in the leadership capacity. One, Bridge Art Gallery, because you were very instrumental in us curating um, 14C, the 14C room for Pro Arts. Um, Danielle Scott was the curator, um, um, the name of the show right now is Escaping. Oh, yeah. Empowerment. Empowerment show, which was like mind blowing, not only the scale, but the number of artists, the the incredible work. Um, you bought Ulysses in the Fold, who has worked with artists from Theta Sandiford to Heather Williams and you know lots of other artists in between. Um, I believe you brought Ivy to the table too, right? No, uh, no, Ivy Brown was already part of the mix. <laughs> okay. We take credit for that. But I will say, I want to go back to the empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, part of my journey at Pro Arts has been about um, th the voices and giving mm -hmm. some diversity. Uh, Pro Arts has had the reputation in the past of being like an older, like white organization. And right. I wanted to ensure that, look, if I'm going to be here, I'm making some noise. The, the table is now mine. And if mm -hmm. you guys don't agree to what's happening at the table, I will flip over the table. So it is right. the balance of being nice and being able to play the game, but also ensuring that the jobs that I want to get done, get done. And um, with Pro Arts, we opened our first gallery 
the, um, Pro Arts was like a nomadic organization, never having a real home for uh, art, never having their own gallery, always um, getting space sponsored or leveraging partnerships in order to get space. And over the last few years, we've worked closely with the Jersey City Arts Council, with uh, Robinson Holloway, with uh, Art Fair 14C, and developed the Art 150 space at 150 Bay in downtown Jersey City. And the first show um, that was going to be in the gallery space uh, was a show around civil justice and the civil uprising during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and we needed a curator that would uh, really get the, the purpose and focus of the show. And we had talked through a number of people. And in the back of my mind, I knew the only person that I knew that could do this in the way that it needed to be done was Danielle Scott. Mm -hmm. Because of her vision, her work, um, the research that she puts into the work, being an artist and an activist, I knew that she could do it and would do it. And I wanted that first show, the first show to be curated in that gallery, the first show to go up in that gallery to be curated by a woman of color. Mm -hmm. And I knew that it wasn't just because she was a woman of color, but it was because she was a fabulous artist and knew the vision. And it's a bonus that she's a woman of color that could show out and put together a show of over like a hundred pieces. Right. Um, and have this show be dynamic and breathtaking and um, help to bridge uh, the Jersey City community, the larger US. We had artists from all over the country and also bringing artists that are typically identified like with the Newark art scene, bringing them to Jersey City in this new space. Right. Um, was amazing. So the empowerment means a lot to me um, because it was a lot of first happening with that show. Well, Danielle said that she loves you so much. I love her right back. <laughs> and I love her too. But you know, that that show, you know, it, it was a part of that, you know, kind of breaking the mold on yeah. multiple levels. Because I, I do feel like after that moment, after that exhibition, it wasn't just pro arts Jersey City. Right. It was artists. Right, right. And I wanted to make sure that throughout throughout time, and like even on our board, you mentioned um, Ulysses and Heather Williams. They're both now part of the, the board. Anthony Boone, also part of the board now. And I thought it was important to mix it up. Let's right. make sure that our voices and communities um, are always represented. And that wasn't always the case. So um, we needed a little seasoning in the pot. Well, it is seasoned Cajun style. <laughs> the hot sauce in my bag swag seasoned. Yeah. So, I mean, and that was also like the Meet the Curators event that uh, I've asked you uh, and Chris from Bridge Art Gallery to be curators on the panel. Mm -hmm. um, Laura Palmer with um, Aquaba. Aquaba Gallery. Mm -hmm. um, Joel Lopez, independent curator, making sure that the curators that are reviewing artists' work and like our professional development events get our aesthetic right. and get that there are different there are different ways of executing art, um, different types of faces, different styles, different flavor. It does not lessen the value of the work, um, the importance of the message, and and sometimes it takes uh, a different perspective um, in reviewing the work to get it. I would say this. Um... And, and again, this is not saying this exists for all artists of color, but um, artists of color, be it, you know, African-American, um, um, Hispanic, um, Indian, Asian, like we have a different color palette. Yeah. And we often insert our culture in our artwork and very, you know, unique um, sometimes subtle, sometimes very specific ways, and yeah. um, and and I, I and I love that because I, I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, we primarily show a lot of artists of color with the work that we do. 
Yeah, I think it's also because artists bring themselves to the work. So you're going to get a different flavor if it is someone of a different background. Like you, it's not the, the norm, the standard, whatever that is, um, what we typically would see um, for years, what we've seen for years. And now I feel like there truly is this renaissance where mm -hmm. Black female artists are getting their shine. Yes. And have always been worth it, have always been some of the, the strongest mind-blowing artists out there. But it's, t it's a moment of recognition where people are like, ah, I get it. I understand it now. And let's name check Theda Sandiford, Theda, Daniel Scott, Martrice Roach. Martrice Roach, like there, Heather Williams. Mm -hmm. There's so many big voices big powerful voices in our community that mm -hmm. now even if you decided to look the other way you can't because they're on that way too they're on that side right. and then you look on, the, they're they're on that side too they're, they're in the there. new york times like mm -hmm. Theta, like in the new york times right now like that's yes. major stuff mm -hmm. um you know going to miami and doing shows and um danielle being in a show with uh malin gallery and uh man and contemporary in miami and being one of the featured artists in this big show that was covered in all these different art publications, the, the big names. Um, and Theta being down in Miami, and me being down in Miami, like all of us down there um, shaking things up and being in the little rooms and the big rooms when these art conversations are happening. So it's, it's a gift. It's not anything I take for granted, but I recognize that we are in a very special time that uh, people are getting the recognition. So let's talk about the, the big rooms that you've been in most recently, because you just brushed over that you were at Art Basel. <laughs> yeah, I just got back uh, from, I did the show Aqua um, down in Miami and it was amazing. I, I am very intentional about what I, what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and doing the show in Miami, I realize it's always a heavy lift. It is a lot of work. It's a lot of energy um, during that time. But I wanted to show up and show out and wanted to show big work, bold work that would make an impact. And I, I feel like that worked. It worked out. I think you did a little something, something. It worked out. It worked out. Um so yeah, I, I'm super excited about all the things that are happening and that have happened. You know, it's been a big couple weeks. I mean, coming from Miami um, and then right into last week with the award and then also last week um, getting notification that I've been accepted into a residency in France. What? And so I will be in France all of February as when my mom, when I told my mom, she was like, in Black History Month, you can be in France with Black History <laughs> So it's like that's your reaction, but that's what she said. You can be, you are gonna be in France for Black History Month, um, and you Daniel, are Black History. I am Black History. I always say I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. If my grandparents saw all the amazing things that were happening right now, they're all past. Mm -hmm. They would be blown away. But at the same time, I know they're with me. I feel my grandmother with me all the time when, like, when big stuff happens. Um, so I know that they would be like blown away. Like, this is some good stuff. So we making history here. So yeah, I will be in France um, for residency and trying to um, be present and create something that just feels good for that moment. I'm not, I'm not going, yeah, we are our ancestors while there's dreams. Like I'm not, I'm not focused on like the end result. I'm just happy to be in the mix. So. Mm -hmm. I'm excited. I have no idea what I'm going to work on while I'm there, but I know we it'll are, We are so proud of you and this accomplishment mm -hmm. with this residency. Like It's, it's great. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is that um, it, this all started, uh, the residency, this particular residency came about uh, because artist Demarcus McGoey did the same residency last February mm -hmm. and said, you guys need to apply for this. This is going to be amazing. I'm like, eh, all right, I'll apply, whatever. Like, and didn't think about it too much. And as a result, 
a number of us are headed to France for different residencies at different times. It just so happens I'll be there in February. Danielle will be there in March and she'll also be there with Santanya Allen. Like mm -hmm. they will be there. And it's, we will literally just pass each other. Um, at the train station. <laughs> I'll just be getting, getting back and they'll be heading there. So it's just, it's, it's great. I know that things are changing and shifting and um, we're doing what we're supposed to do. I love it. So how, uh, you know, how would you describe your approach to opportunities? Um, you know, I often, you know, tease and say you're an attractress in the sense that you attract these opportunities. But how would you describe it in, in your own words? I, I am intentional. There was a time that I would put art at every envelope opening, every funeral home and pizza shop. If you needed art, I would send it. Right. Now I've been blessed with the opportunity to not have to do that, to mm -hmm. not um, go for every call for art that goes out there and be a little more selective. So now I am selective about the opportunities and the galleries that I work with and partner with because I'm so conscious and aware of the power of having a brand and what right. that means and being consistent about my work, about my focus. And so I'm a little selective and that's also self-preservation because I have so many things, you know, so many balls in the air at any given time that I, when I show up, I want to show up, show out and, and have it be correct. So I'm a little more intentional. I actually, my speech <laughs> from last week, we only had 10 words was be intentional, be bold, be fiercely kind, and love hard. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what I try and live by. Mm -hmm. um, and so everything that I do, I'm, I try to be intentional. I try to be bold. I always try and be, you know, fiercely kind to people and love on people. So that's, that's kind of, that's my, my movement in the world and with art. And, you know, in the way that you move, you get that energy back tenfold. Yeah. Um, because I think, you know, when you're intentional, I think when you're intentional, one, it's it's a part of like manifesting mm -hmm. what you want for yourself, what you want for your life. But it's that um, that keen focused energy that others recognize and they're like, OK, if I if I'm going to step into kind of your light into your realm, I, I got to come with it too. light attracts light. Mm -hmm. Light brings light. Light attracts light. Um, and so it's important that what I put out, I get back. But that's not the reason why I do it. I, I literally just try and embody the best parts of myself. And that's what I try and offer to the world through art, through connection, um, and just loving on people. Yeah, so, I love you. Yeah, I, I love, love you me. back. <laughs> and, and so what it does, it kind of creates an environment where it like... Uh, an event like Expressive Creative Soul comes and they are, um, you know, all of us coming together for its work, its art, but it's a party, you know, because right. we're connecting, which means uh, it's about that time again for you guys to do it again, right? It's time. Actually, we, we are. We're doing our first Wilmington edition of Expressive Creative Soul and it's going to open on uh, Friday, January 6th at the Reading Gallery on French Street um, in Wilmington, Delaware. And just to kind of give everyone, if you're not aware of the history of Expressive Creative Soul, it was actually the first show that Christopher and I did. And we wanted to, again, being intentional, feature um, emerging artists as well as established artists and really just providing an opportunity for artists to be able to, um, to show their work. But it's also a reflection of, um, you know, our personal taste in artists. But we found that through Expressive Creative Soul is actually how we built our art family. Yeah. It because the artists that have participated, um, that it, it means something to them and it means something to us that they, you know, I always say, you know, artists give their, let us borrow their art babies, but yeah. we take care of them, their artwork, like it's their, their baby, because you've given, again, you're all in creating the work. And it, I feel like each year just kind of builds on our, our art family. So we're, 
featuring some Delaware-based artists that we've recently met and connected with, as well as, you know, our 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 home New Jersey artist as well. I and you know, your artwork will be a part of one of your pieces because you know it's 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 the tra tradition. <laughs> I have to do, do this show every year. You have <laughs> to do the show every year. And Danielle, I know you're watching, so I'm I'm coming to get a couple of pieces from you too. Martrice, if you're on here, I'm coming for you too. You got a cure rate. You got a cure rate. <laughs> <laughs> But we found that the, you know, the Wilmington community is um, just as vibrant as um, and connected as, you know, our New Jersey community. And um, hi, Mama D. <laughs> Mama Diane English is here. Hugs to you too, my love. Um, <laughs> but we're also, you know, still doing things in, in New Jersey too. We have a show called uh, Figures from the Field that we're doing at Nimbus. Oh, nice. um, and that opening is on Wednesday, um, January 11th. Y'all are going to be busy. Yes. Y'all are going to be busy. Like stacking on, stacking on, stacking <laughs> on, stacking on. Um, so Nimbus is also a, a favorite. I just finished a project with Nimbus like back in October where one of my paintings, New York City, was um, used to create the costumes for their premiere piece for this season. So that was uh, amazing. Shout out to Sam and the Nimbus crew. Nimbus family, yes, we Nimbus love family. them. Yeah, and so that was great. So actually, the figures in the field actually features all the people that you've collaborated with, now that I think about it. I love it. So Danielle mentioned Bright Lighters. Bright Lighters was the name of my collaboration show. So I love yes. that. Um, we're going to come back to the collaboration show um, because it speaks about who you are. Um, so the figures from the field at Nimbus is actually, um, it's gonna be an annual show. And the first year or iteration of the show is actually going to feature influencers, people who have dedicated their professional and personal lives to advancing the art careers of others. So you have Christian, uh, Kristen DeAngelis. Oh yeah. Jim Pastorini and Anne from the drawing room and um, uh, Donna, Donna. Donna Kessinger. Donna Kessinger. Okay. So we're <laughs> actually going to, you know, they influence so many artists careers, but they're also very extremely talented artists in their own rights. All and of so them. we're curating a show that actually features their work. I love that. I love that. I love that. So let's go back to the Bright Lighters, your collaboration show, so, which I felt like was a, we, we did host the show at the gallery and I felt like it was a Brian Smith Love Fest. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? So Bright Lighters, I always use the term Bright Lighters. So I was, I'm a cancer survivor and every year the Leukemia, Leukemia Lymphoma Society um, does this light the night walk and mm -hmm. Um, they always came up with this team. You needed a team name. And I came up with Bright Lighters. And what it was is that like a group of people that really kind of light up my life and support me um, and kind of help me lead the way. So I always think about Bright Lighters. So when presented with the opportunity to do another show at Bridge Art, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to like have all these different artists, but in rewinding several years ago, Bright Lighters came about because of your idea. You had a dream mm -hmm. years ago. You're like, I had this dream that you did this show, that it was all pieces that you had collaborated with all these different artists, and it was a show. And here, you know, here it is, fast forward a number of years, and that ended up being what the show was. I have, I admire so many artists. I'm a big collector. And I wanted to do all of these pieces with different artists that mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily think me to collaborate with all the time. Right. So um, it was a show made up of all my art friends and um, family and did this cool show that every piece that was in there was a collaboration with me and other artists. So it was great. Phenomenal artists, like phenomenal artists, in talent and in spirit because Absolutely. you are 
to attract what you are. And I, I can honestly say that I thoroughly enjoy meeting and working with each of the artists that you collaborated with. It um, was, because they were just such beautiful people. Yeah, I, I only work with good people. Like if you're, I, I stay away from, if it's a bad energy, I don't get the right vibe from it. Right. I try not to partner in that space, especially when it comes to art. Like art is so personal and sacred and a safe space and a happy place for me. I'm not peppering it with, you know, someone that's negative and it doesn't feel right. And yes, my mom is in the room. I talked about her earlier, so make sure you follow her. Yes, um, Miss Diane English, put your, um Instagram handle in the chat. She's a phenomenal artist, fierce, bad mama jamma to the max. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, that, I mean, that show was, great. was, yeah, the show was, you know, great. So you just came back from Miami. Yes. You just got an award. Yes. You're about to go to France. <laughs> is, there, is, there, is there anything we're missing? Like, um, what? follow me on TikTok. Uh, oh. Bfly seven seven seven. Um, so th th one let's of my talk about, let, let's talk about TikTok. Yes. So one of my my tasks when I originally moved to New York, I thought I was moving to New York to go to college, and I was going to go to um, makeup school with one of my good friends, Renata. We were going to go to New York, and we were going to become makeup artists. And when I moved here, I already had a job, and then my career in marketing and um, advertising took off and makeup kind of fell to the background. And then my ex-husband was a, yes, ex-husband was a makeup artist and that was his space. So I never, you know, like I always loved Halloween and makeup and creativity. And during the pandemic, in addition to our like Friday night cooking nights, I started to play around with makeup again. I found my old makeup box and was like, hmm, I should, you know, kind of, have fun and do something that wasn't related to art. Shout out to Crystal again, the therapist, saying, you know, you need to find something that is not, you know, motivated in business. You need to find something that's just for you that you enjoy. And I was like, what is something that's just for me that has nothing to do with a brand, with making money, anything? Um, and it was makeup. And so now um, I'm like a mini influencer on TikTok. And no, now, no, not, not many. We're not. We're not minimum. What well, we no, I'm. I'm going by definition. I have like close to almost twenty five thousand followers. I'm like, no, like twenty three thousand followers. You become like an influencer, influencer above fifty k just by the definition. So I call myself a mini influencer, but we're gonna get there. Um, okay. But it's all about. Uh, makeup and creating in the moment. And some people are like, you're just painting art on your face. And this is another way of thinking about it. It's an mm -hmm. extension of the art and creativity. Um, it's just in a different way. And it wasn't something that I intended or set out for it to become anything more than fun. And now it is becoming um, something that people recognize me for in just another space. And so what let's I- just, Let's just clear so people understand when you say that you're doing makeup, I'm not talking about like, okay, beat my face before yeah. I go out. No, he is, it's just mind blowing what you do. You randomly pick a color yeah. palette. So I don't, and doing I don't this have all to on live yeah. and he's creating art. I guess it's a, it's a live art show. It's, Every, a, it's a live okay. art show. A couple and times it, during the night, a couple it, times during the week. Deb, it's, um, I, I, you just have to, if you're on Instagram, go to bfly777faces. Beef, yes. <laughs> if you're on TikTok. Just bfly777. If you're on Bego, I'm on Bego now, bfly777. Okay, I don't even hear to that. Like, I don't even know what that is. It's, it's another streaming app that's very, very busy, but um, starting to gain some traction there as well. But it, it it was really born out of just having a good time. I don't go in with a plan. It's the same as when I paint. I can't go in with a plan. Um, I may go in with a color palette, but typically I use a random color palette selector, um, choose some 
um, some colors and I just go. I don't know whether it's gonna be, oh, thanks, Danielle. Um, mm -hmm. It's not anything that I plan out. So I'm mm -hmm. not looking at photos or references. I, I think three times I've used a reference saying this is something that I was um, inspired by. And one of them was like this painting from um, the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Um, so but I just, think that's what makes it so magical, Brian, is the fact that you are really kind of surrendering yourself to the the medium of makeup to create art live yeah. and just letting it. And it's the same thing. There are some times that it works and there are some times that it doesn't work and I have to figure my way out of it. The challenge in doing makeup live is that I'm also talking to people while it's happening. And people mm -hmm. are like, you're like therapy to me. Like, I love when you come on and they're, we're talking stuff out and they're asking questions and mm -hmm. teaching people about makeup as I learn and trying new things. Um, and it it is completely selfish. It is fun for me. It's creative. And it just so happens that they're in the space. But even mm -hmm. if nobody showed up, I'd probably still be doing it because that's where it started out as with me just doing makeup and like mm -hmm. my little makeup area now. So. so, you know, I'm your number one cheerleader besides <laughs> your mama. Mama, yeah. yeah, I do respect that you're number one cheerleader. So I'm, <laughs> I'm like one B. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that you have the Midas touch. And we talk all the time um, about um, the fact that, um, you know, that 20, that you're in your harvest season. Yeah, You and I have these conversations all the time about being in the harvest season and that even when you are just working things out, like with makeup to find your own piece, you create magic. And suddenly, you know, you got, it's like that scene from, um, what's that movie with uh, uh, Tom, Tom Hanks where he's running? Oh. And he turns yeah. around and everybody is running behind him. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that you were about to say you got the glow like the last dragon. So <laughs> Yeah. I, I like the Tom Hanks one. <laughs> you run you know I'm cartwheeling for him. I love it. Yeah, you're, you're running just for your own sake, and all of a sudden you got like a whole army of people like following behind you. It's unbelievable. I, I'm telling you, I never would have expected any of this stuff in the way that is happening. And, and that's the truth. Like, but what it's taught me is that I can dream a bigger dream for myself. I can see um, anything is possible. Like with a plan, if I can sort it out, I can get a lot of stuff accomplished. Now that does come at the sacrifice of sometimes sleeping as much as I want to, or being able to sit still and do nothing. That's mm -hmm. something that I'm now trying to get better about is just saying, no, I'm not doing that today. I'm right. only going to do this and find time. But I also realized in order to get it all done, I need as many hours of the day possible and as much coffee as my body can stand. Mm -hmm. And um, but that's what it is. And it's not a complaint. It's just that's just what it is that in order well, to have. You're passionate about something. But it's what I want. It's right. what I want. So I can't, like, I always go back to this thing. You cannot complain about your plate being full when all you wanted to do was eat. Mm. I always go back to that when I'm having that day of, like, what the hell am I doing? That I'm like, baby, this is what you wanted. You are right. getting exactly what you wanted. So now it's like, all right, I'll be, I'll be tired. I'm like, I got bags under my eyes, but we got makeup to fix that. So it's like, what You're going to be tired in France, so... Yeah, I'll be tired. I'm, I, in France, I'll be working full time. I'll still be working my job. I'll still be doing TikTok and I'll still be working on art. It's just my schedule is going to be flipped. So mm -hmm. I, I would um, I would say this, that I know that you're an inspiration to so many others. And I hope that, you know, our viewing audience today um, picks up the nuggets of being truthful to yourself. Um, being intentional about what you want, um, feeding what feeds you, mm -hmm. um, and and dreaming bigger. Yeah, I don't don't be afraid to go big, go big or go home. 
I I did I feel like I'm speaking in like these are my show titles, but my first solo show was Big Beautiful Crazy. Mm-hmm. And that's because I've had a big, beautiful, crazy life where big things happen, stuff mm-hmm. that you wouldn't even think of, television stuff. Like, who does that happen to? That kind okay. of stuff. Okay, hold on. Mention it. For those who don't know, you have appeared on television a number of times. A number of times. For good reasons and not really bad reasons, <laughs> but Yeah. So it's like big, big, beautiful things happening. And it's mm-hmm. like, wow, this is pretty cool. So that's beautiful, crazy. I, I think that um, your ability to be open to opportunities, because, oh, yeah. you know, so often people are looking for opportunities, but they want the opportunities to come knocking on their door when you have to be out in the mix in order to, you know, make those make those connections yeah you have to it's also a, a balance of hunting for opportunities um and being open to whatever comes i am more likely to say yes before i think about it okay like oh you you want to do something yeah and then i'm like oh damn how am i going to fit this as my schedule and then um i figure it out but the only the no factor is coming into play now to save some space for myself because I've said yes so much and it's all great things, but at some point you got to sit down. Like sit but down. But that's where the wisdom, that's where the wisdom kicks in. Like the wisdom kicks in to say, mm, something about this doesn't feel right. So I'm going to say no. Yeah. But the wisdom also kicks in to say, Hmm, something about this feels a little different. So I'm, yeah. I'm roll with this. <laughs> let me, let me do that real quick. Let me, let me mm-hmm. figure this out. And that's usually what I, I always go back to, like, do it scared, even if it's something I've never done before. Do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Figure it out. Um, and not the the key is not knowing that I don't know everything. Right. I don't know everything. I don't know what's going to happen next. But I know if I stay ready, I don't have to get ready. So say I it just, again. Wait, wait, oh, wait. Listen. Say that again for the people in the back. <laughs> if I stay ready, I don't have to get ready. So mm-hmm. that's that's what I that's what I kind of go with. I, go I think with. you need a book. I think you need like a little coffee table book. Well, we talk with, about this. With, with these sayings and these mantras, like you know, B fly seven seven sevens artist mantras. <laughs> Just a collection of random things that I say and that I live by. But I mean, the oh other- wait, wait. And it could have like a piece of artwork and a saying. And then my face on another page with these makeup looks that embodies the work that you saw on the previous page. Oh, that. I've thought about this stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens next. It's like I am trying to keep a lot of my world separate. Like, I, Mm -hmm. because I still work in corporate. Um, I have a full time art career, I have this social media thing going that mm-hmm. I try not to have all the pieces come together at once. But um, I'm finding that when it comes to art and when it comes to makeup, which is also art, the worlds are slowly but surely kind of coming together. And I just have to figure out the best way for them to kind of coexist and maybe mm-hmm. you know bring them together somehow. So that's something, I'm working on it. I'm working it out and we'll see well, what I- enjoy watching your journey. I enjoy sitting next to Mama D going, go ahead, go ahead. You go, boy. <laughs> I love, but I also love the part where it's like, what are you doing? All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. And and kind of everybody giving me the space to figure it out and to do it and hopefully turn it into gold every time. Right. You know, but having the space to like, I have no idea why you're doing that, but okay. And then but I, I know you've been in, inspirational, even in your own family. Like, I think about your niece. Oh, yeah. Um, Jazzy Bonbons, shout yeah. out. Jazzy Bonbons. Uh, she's running a holiday special, cinnamon buns and everything else, some new stuff. Listen, this this candy is art and it is delicious. And so even that came about in in Bridge Art Gallery. We were sitting there doing mm-hmm. an artist exchange, the info exchange, and my mm-hmm. niece was in town. 
and we sat at the table and she started to talk about chocolates. And you said, mm -hmm. ooh, wouldn't it be cool to like take your art, your paintings and somehow get them on the chocolates? And I can see you talking. I don't know what I'm just saying. <laughs> and <laughs> my, my niece tried alcohol ink and has been nailing it. So I'm like, okay, relax on trying to do what I do. <laughs> um, but she is a gifted artist and mm -hmm. pastry chef. Right. And now like a chocolatier, if that's the, the correct term, mm -hmm. um, making amazing chocolates that not only look good, but taste good. Listen, I bought a box. It was like a medium sized box. And I said, oh, I'm just going to have a couple and I'm going to put it in the refrigerator for later. That door to that refrigerator kept opening back up. The yeah, chocolate yeah. saying, come back. Come back. Come back. Really delicious. <laughs> <laughs> but the chocolate is. The chocolate is so delicious and it's so pretty that, you know, you feel bad eating it because it's so, it looks so pretty. But then because when you, you taste it. it mm. <laughs> so, Ooh. yeah, I, I, I know that art is um, such a, a, a thread. Mm-hmm. Um, throughout everything that I do. And I think the people that I'm around too, that even people that don't consider themselves artists start to gain a respect and love for art and what artists go through. Because um, mm -hmm. I try and be transparent about how difficult it is being an artist. And um, it is a lot of work. It is a lot of money creating. And that mm -hmm. goes into the pricing for the people in the back that always say things like, Art is so expensive, but you are paying for every sleepless night, every right. Uber ride to Michael's, mm -hmm. um, you know, every drop off and pickup. That is part of the artist's journey and their experiences in, in making art. And that doesn't come cheap. Like giving you a part of my soul every time is not cheap. Right. It comes at a cost. So um, art is always for sale, guys. Don't forget that. Yes. And where can people find your collection of art? So you can find me one if you ever want to do a studio visit. I uh, my studio, my my main studio is housed at Manor Contemporary in Jersey City. Hit me up. Um, you can find me on social media. Uh, my website is bfly777.com. Uh, Instagram for my art bfly777. For makeup on TikTok is bfly777 um on ig for makeup i need like a roster of things for makeup on uh instagram is bfly777 faces so i think those are all the places we don't talk about twitter anymore um, mm -mm. so yeah those are the places that you can find me um i'm always an email or telephone call text away when people want to talk if they want art advice if they just want to cut up Call me. Hit me on the hip. <laughs> so um, your art is featured um, with many private collectors. Yes. Um, at two different locations for Jersey City Medical in Jersey City. Love it. Um, so it has, uh, it works well in corporate environments as well as residential environments. Yes. And I do commissions. He does do commissions. So. so can we close out with talking about our art family? Yes. So our art family, as Brian alluded um, earlier, um, started February 2020 uh, with Expressive Creative Soul and the artists that were a part of that discussion. And um, and it's, uh, it's continued from that moment because from that, that conversation, everyone kind of, again, took it upon themselves to uh, support one another, um, to support other artists, um, and really just to be a, a lifeline, you know, for yeah. everyone else. And so our our members, I want to make sure I don't I don't miss anyone. Uh, the members um, include uh, Christopher Mack, Babu, Babu, Peter Sandiford, Cortez. Explore Freedom, Danielle Scott, Anthony Boone, Phil Robinson, Martrice Roach, and uh, Troy Jones. Troy Jones, Joe Woods. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many more artists. I, I feel like it's growing and growing and growing. I mm -hmm. think that that's where the, the group started. Like all of us just kind of talking through the work and um, like being connected and 
um, a number of us all have studios at Mana Contemporary. And so yes. that kind of further supports that bond. And like Anthony Boone and I curated Danielle's solo show that's now up at Gallery of Pharaoh for another few weeks. And we try and make sure that we show up for one another, that if it is a night where you need somebody to just kind of talk you through a difficult moment, those moments of doubt, we are always there for one another. But most importantly, we are there to celebrate each other. Absolutely. And in art, there's this um, kind of this underlying thing that all artists are competing. And I truly feel in our art community, our art circle, that isn't there. No. Um, I think if anything, we inspire each other and push each other. We have all done a piece where we like, no, I need to take my ass home and start painting because you, you showing out and that motive, we motivate each other through art, but try and present every opportunity to one another to grow, to be seen, to participate in different shows um, whenever possible. We are always holding the door open for the next behind us. And we challenge everyone who's viewing today, um, whether you're an artist um, or in your respective field or field of interest, to do just that. Um, that you know we're we're stronger together. We you know no one benefits from operating in a silo, and it's really from the spirit of collaboration um, that you know we all thrive. Um, so that we're all sitting at the table, you know, feasting. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the world is a better place when we work together. Absolutely. I agree. I agree. I love chatting with you. I mean, this is supposed to be an hour and here we are at hour and a half and we could probably- it? Oh yeah. All right, we bye y'all. I get you now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm Danielle. When Danielle says when one wins, we all win. Absolutely. One and all and when we win, we win. So I, I love you to pieces. I am right so proud to call you friend. I'm so, you know, ecstatic that you trust us with your art babies to bring them down to Wilmington, Delaware, to show them on the walls. And I mean, it's just, I feel so excited for you when I see someone, you know, experience your art for the first time. And they're just like, oh my gosh, like, they're like, what am I looking at? Because it, it's your art is an immersive experience, especially these large pieces. Like so it's the only way to go now. Y'all better snatch up these uh, these small pieces because I don't paint small no more. Y'all better get one of these. That's and the actually, same. hold on, let's see. Um, I can show what the exhibit looks like. I mean, these pieces are just spectacular. The way they they just you know pop out the wall. Those are it. Those are the babies. So thank you, Bryant. Thank, thank you, you, everyone, for tuning in and for commenting, um, for joining the, the Cheryl and Bryant Love Fest. This is just what we do <laughs> once a week when we catch up. <laughs> you all just got us on camera. That's all. That's right. So next time you got to beat my face. So, you know. I'm ready. This is so crazy. I got lipstick in my pocket. I was like, what is that in my pocket? So I'll be doing makeup tonight live on TikTok and Bego at some point. So come on. Mm -hmm. Well, we love you too, Danielle. Love you too. We love we love Peg. We love Mama Diane. Yes. Thanks for you. tuning in, everybody. Yes. yes. And we you. need another trip. Or you need y'all need to come to France. Come to France, go to Morocco. I'm oh. I'm with it. All right. We ain't gonna tell the people where to find us. Don't be stalking us. I know. Don't be stalking us, but maybe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for this. Like, seriously, you guys mean so much to me. I feel like it's everything started because of you guys. Yes, I did the art and everything else, but you guys have been a conduit for like the art stratosphere, like opening up. So um, I'm always going to come back home. Y'all always get it first all of those things because like I wouldn't be here without the support that you and Chris have given to myself and the larger art community. Um, yeah. So Wilmington is lucky to have y'all like every day, but we ain't going nowhere. We're, we're not going nowhere. Matter of fact, we're about to expand. Like, you know, Wilmington is just the first satellite right. location. 
Um, and special shout out to Christopher Mack because nothing Wonderful. happens without him. Um, he is all things creative, makes us look good, sound good. And, and he's um, an amazing artist. Don't forget that part. An amazing yeah. artist. He is. And he's, oh, uh, let me just give him a shout out. Every Saturday, Christopher is um, drawing live on YouTube Saturday mornings. So you all can right. catch him on Mac Sketches um, to uh, watch him draw live. And, um, you know, hear a little convo. No, it's like, it's like, it's after dark, like, you know, nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> so again, thank you everyone for tuning yes. in. Yes. And, um, you know, we love you guys and be creative. My art, yes. art makes a great gift. 100% buy it. Okay. Thanks everybody. Ciao.